Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with jazz trombonist Joe Feidler. He was born and raised in Pittsburgh, PA, and just released a new album, 2017's Like Strange. Along with solo work, he is the musical director for Sesame Street, and over seven seasons, he has written over 250 arrangements and crafted more than 5,000 underscoring cues. He spent some time at the University of Pennsylvania before hitting the road with the Glenn Miller Orchestra and working in pit orchestras for Broadway shows. He's also had some quality time with the great Joey Sellers and the great Eddie Palmieri, along with many others over the years. He is a very flavor-rich story, so get to know him and dig this interview, my friends. I am really looking forward to delving into your history here. So, real, real quick, are you a baseball fan, big baseball fan? I'm just more of a sports guy. I, mean, I grew up in Pittsburgh in the 70s, and the Pirates won the series, and the Steelers, and the soup, you know, so I, I had a good, good experience as a kid. Man, I'll tell you what, when I was a kid, the big thing is logos, and my logo was the Pittsburgh Steelers thing, and I had a sweatsuit. That was my team growing up. I thought that was <laughs> that was the bee's knees. I wore that thing out until the knees literally could not even pull up over my legs. <laughs> so that's funny. Yeah, I got a fond spot in my heart for Pittsburgh, but uh, we're going to get yeah. into that kind of up front a little bit here. But I just want to ask right. you: I, I received your CD. I love it, and I got a real affinity for the trombone lately. I've been talking to a lot of cats in the world of modern music, like Michael Deese and the great Nick Spencer. Mm -hmm. I've just, I've been really getting into the trombone. It's one of those things like the vibraphone or the Hammond B3. It's one of those specialized instruments that bands don't really, I don't know, it just seems like it's a part of the band instead of being the lead, so I'm looking forward to really delving into this with you. That sounds great. So right up front, let me ask you, what has been going on with you lately? You got the new CD, Life Strange, but other than that, tell me what's going on. In a nutshell, my main, my day gig, as it were, even though it's not in a day necessarily, is I'm, I'm one of the music directors at Sesame Street, the TV show. Um, so I'm the orchestrator and arranger, and I compose all the underscoring and incidental music for the last seven and a half years at Sesame Street. Since I got that gig... I used to play, I mean, with backtrack, I used to play literally 350 to 400 gigs a year. I mean, played almost every night, two times a day, and traveled constantly. And since then, so where it brings me to now, since Sesame Street, I kind of pared everything down to I just do my gigs or jazz soloist gigs or recording sessions and then let all the other kind of working man trombone gigs go away. And a lot of guys who teach, like Mike Dees does that too. He teaches, and then he just plays jazz gigs. So aside from my project, I mean, I have, besides this new quintet, I have a trio I keep working with, and I have a brass group called Big Sack Butt. We just played last week, and with, it's three trombones and tuba, talking about a trombone-heavy group. And with guys you know, I mean, Marshall Jilks played with me last week, and, and Ryan Keberly, who's fantastic. And So I... Aside from that, I play with Eddie Palmieri. is kind of my main big sideman gig, and uh, we have a you know thing at Lincoln Center coming up in a couple weeks. But it's really just small group jazz stuff, and and the Sesame Street thing. I actually also I'm getting preparing for. I'm doing this unusual um, record date. There's a guy in in, Cal or in Texas who has this record label called New Scope. That he kind of not fancies himself the wrong word, but kind of identifies with ECM. And um, he puts together projects, and I'm going to do a trio record that he put together with the great saxophone player John Aravagon and a guitar player, Todd Neufeld, who actually is fantastic. I've never played with. So we're, I'm writing music right now this week for that, that date as well. So that kind of puts you where I am today. You know, people have to think you're joking around when you say, hey, where, where are you going today? You say, oh, I'm going to work. I'm heading to Sesame Street. They have to think you're joking around. <laughs> <laughs> of course. You are a king amongst kids, man. That is That has to be a very – that has to be just one of the coolest gigs ever growing up with that. I mean, did, are you kind of be speckled by it sometimes? I am. I, it's – I mean, it's just obviously such an iconic show, and we're we're starting right now the 48th season of it. I mean, like think about that, 48. It's ridiculous. Wow. And, and it's easy. I'll say that 
it's easy for me to lose track of it because, first of all, I, I write the music from wherever I am. If I'm on tour, I'm still writing cues, or most of the time I'm just at home. Like, I'm in my little writing studio right now. And it's important for me to kind of go to the set when they shoot at least once or twice a year and see it's truly magical. And there's always going to be kids around the set and just how powerful it is. It's really a special thing. Absolutely. And it's also kind of interestingly in perspective. Like I always, sometimes when things are rough and I think how hard it is being a jazz trombone player, then I go there and I think, ah, being a professional puppeteer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you rungs lower than. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, man. So it seems like you all you, you have a lot of side gigs as you kind of touched on a little bit, but with your newest album, like Strange, talk to me about what it's like to be a soloist. How you feel about this album, or I shouldn't even say soloist, but being a leader of your own, you know, album. Talk to me about this album and how you feel about it now. I feel great about it. I can say right off the bat, this is my eighth album as a leader. Without a doubt, I feel the best I've ever felt of any of the records. And that's not to say it's better or worse. I don't mean it in those terms. I mean, you know, in the beginning of a pro the process, like I'm going to put a band together, I'm going to write these certain kind of tunes, and, and in your head you have a, a you know a blurry vision of as what it's going to sound like. And, and as you go towards the record day, you keep honing it and you rehearse and you do gigs, and, and it becomes clear how you want to proceed. And then you get to the studio and it... It's kind of what I wanted. It, it, I mean, give or take a couple moments. It's. I remember I, on the way home, we recorded over two days, and I took. I, I live upstate, uh, just out of New York, about an hour, and taking the train ride home from the studio, and I was able to listen to it right away. Which, as most guys will tell you, they're like, "Don't listen to it because you'll hate it right away," and then you kind of grow to love your own records. A lot of people, at least a lot of people, feel that way, and I do too, to a degree. But this one. And again, it's not to say that the playing was any better or worse. I just find that I'm being better at being a band leader, and I could I could project what's going to happen. And it's, and it's part of it is writing the tunes that fit the players and choosing the right players, and also my ease. I'll tell you, this is one thing where Sesame Street really helped. I I mean, as the orchestra and arranger, I actually produced the sessions, so I've produced just for the TV show hundreds of recording sessions now. So the idea of being in charge of a recording session even though some guys have done many jazz records of their own, but it, it just makes me so much more relaxed and at ease and able to change direction or see what's working or what's not working very easily and intuitively. And I find that really helped this record uh, get to where it is. And, and also having Jeff Letter and Pete McCann, who are two of my oldest friends in New York. I've been here 24 years, and I've known those guys since year one. And those guys are such experienced band leaders themselves. There were several times, which I wouldn't have done in the past necessarily, I would say, Jeff, what do you think we should do here? You, you want to try another take and maybe do something different? Just to bounce something off guys who are just veterans as well. And he would say, yeah, man, why don't we think about it this way? And and they were, were close enough that it, it was very easy for them to contribute, and they didn't feel like they were stepping on my toes. And it really, those, all the those things contributed to it just being so smooth and such a good attitude. And, and I really feel it came off how I wanted to sound like. That's a great sound. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Let me ask you this. As we kind of touched on also already, you grew up in Pittsburgh, PA. Talk to me about your childhood and how you got so in, immersed in music and even jazz. Well, my dad was a casual, I mean, he was a big music fan, but a casual jazz fan. And so I, I have early memories, like specifically the two records he would play a lot that I loved were Oscar Peterson's Night Train with his trio, and then Cannonball, Adderley, Mercy, 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 which is, you know, both of those records are legendary, but those stand up. But I didn't feel that I was growing up in a jazz household, per se. And my dad loved marching bands, too, and, and all kinds of things, and it really wasn't until later, until I was in college, that I started listening to jazz more seriously. Unlike most guys I know who are professional, really got the bug much earlier than I did. Um, my cousins, I had, I've told this too many times, I had two older cousins, two brothers who played trumpet, and I really wanted to play trumpet like them, and I ended up on trombone, but they also started teaching me about jazz. And... Again, just then finally in midway through college, to back up a, l a little bit, I, in high school, uh, finally I kind of found my way. I was a self-taught trombone player, and we had j just in the public school system in Pittsburgh, and I loved music, and I wanted to go to 
music school. And but I was also an athlete. I played on the soccer team and the swim team, and and I thought I was since I didn't know any musicians and except for my cousins, I, I just wasn't so sure. My mom, we, you know, we came up in kind of a lower middle income situation. I think she wanted me to have something to fall back on or a job with prospects outside of music. So at the last second, I decided to go to a small liberal arts college. I went to this really great one in Pennsylvania, uh, Allegheny College. It's beautiful and old and like out of the movies. And But that didn't really fit me either. So, And actually, when I went there, I played sports and did the more all-around thing and didn't play trombone. I got away from it. At the last second, instead of going to like Berkeley and Boston, I did that. But then it didn't work out. I, I came back to Pittsburgh and was living with my mom's and I enrolled. I transferred to the University of Pittsburgh and I ran into some old high school friends and they, I mean, just like out of the movie, just more on a whim said, you know, I'm in the jazz band of Pitt and they need a trombone player and why don't you come? And then could I guess the time away, those two and a half years where I didn't play at all, something just all, it all fell into place. And the great saxophone player, Nathan Davis was the head of jazz studies there. And he took me under his wing and it just was like full speed ahead from there. And I just started listening and transcribing. And I mean, I just practiced all day long. That's all I could think of. Even though I didn't, I was not a music major. I was a math major because I was too far along the college pathway to turn back and start all over. So and then I just got out of – I graduated and just was living in Pittsburgh at my mom's and just gigging, and whatever gigs came my way. Well, before we depart those early years when you were in elementary school, mm-hmm. you, wanted to, you wanted to do the trumpet, but your teacher picked the trombone. Yeah. Were you kind of crestfallen, or did you just take the trombone and run with it? As the story goes, I, I had really buck teeth. And we, in, the, in the elementary school system in Pittsburgh, the, the teacher only came once a week. And I remember her vividly, Mrs. Miller, and she would come. And for the first six weeks, uh, I mean, you know, the first week is like, who wants to play? And then they're just taking, you know, permission slips and whatever. And then finally we started buzzing on mouthpieces. That's how it typically works. You just get the mouthpiece. But my teeth are so pronounced, I couldn't make a sound out of the trumpet mouthpiece because it's very small. I couldn't get my lips vibrating. So she gave me a trombone mouth, unbeknownst to me, a trombone mouthpiece. I just thought it was a big trumpet mouthpiece so weeks go by and then she said you know next week we're going to get instruments and you can take your instruments home and everyone was so excited and so of course she hands me a trombone but I was such a shy kid I mean I was so disappointed but I didn't say anything and I just took it and went home with it and just was like all right and that was it I mean literally it was that one little moment and because of my teeth and and yeah, I, I think, to be honest, I remember that day being very disappointed, but once I started practicing it, I just really liked it. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't think I thought, didn't look back in a bummed out way at it. So when you did actually leave Pittsburgh and you go to New York City in 93 and you start playing and you start getting into the scene, were you kind of uh, enamored with being in the big city or was it just kind of a natural transition for you? Um, it, to be honest, that part was very easy. My parents divorced when I was eight, and my dad moved to New Jersey and worked in Manhattan. So I went to visit all the time and rode the subways with my dad as a young kid, and and so it that was great. I knew I knew the city. I mean, I didn't know it like an adult, but I had been there so many times, and it wasn't a big deal in that regard. But I was enamored. I mean, it was exciting, and I had saved a bunch of money. I did these road tours of Broadway shows and. Just to save money, I needed to. I figured I had, and so I had a money in the bank that I could afford to stumble my way through the early times, and at the same time go out five nights a week at least and see music or sit in or go to jam sessions. And it was still a really exciting time that I mean, it doesn't really exist that way anymore, where there was so much music and so many opportunities to play, even for a new guy. Well, in the beginning, too, it's right right out of the gates, you you hit the road with the Glenn Miller Orchestra. You were in the orchestra pit for Broadway shows. What were those early experiences like? They were okay. I, I liked the idea of being a professional musician. I think that was really exciting for me, and to be able to earn money myself in that regard. And I made a lot of great friends. So in those ways, it was a – and it allowed me to make money and still practice the porn, you know I mean? I'm a grinder guy. I don't. I don't ever felt that I was one of these 
prodigy kids remotely who at an early age have a fully formed voice and they're technically amazing. And, and I always value my practice time. So to have those, a place where I could earn a living and, and practice and meet friends and have enough money to go get some beers at the end of the day. And that was great. But the work itself was not very rewarding. And when I did the Glenn Miller band, for example, I had been called the year before to do it and I couldn't do it for some reason but to play the lead trombone because I was always a high note guy and played lead in big bands. So that was, that seemed exciting. And then I couldn't do it, and they called me again a year later, but it was for the third trombone chair, which is the worst, because you have no solos, and you don't play. It's just these playing these inner voicings, which are kind of boring. And So that was really kind of not, not an exciting time. Although, with the Glenn Miller Band, it's the first time I got to really travel. I mean, we went all over the country, and I went to Japan with them. It's the first time I've been anywhere internationally. And that, that really gave me the bug, too. I, I, I was like, wow, I could really get used to it seeing other places. I love to travel. Even to this day, I love to travel. So it wasn't without its purpose. Sure. So what was it like to crash a Cecil Taylor uh, rehearsal? <laughs> well, I was scared, you know, and I didn't know what to do, and I didn't know any of the players. I, went, I had a roommate who I actually met on the Glenn Miller Band named Ben Cohen, and he um, – he was an amazing tenor player. I mean, he's still around. He, he became an educator. He, he, he's an ethnomusicologist now, but we both had the idea. We got we were both fans of the avant-garde and, and kind of, as you heard on the new record, I mean, I'm fans of inside and outside, but at those times, I, I was more drawn to the out guys. And um, we heard just through the grapevine that he was going to start rehearsals for a new big band, which, and now, now knowing the cycle of Cecil's life, he, seems that every 10 years or so for a long time he's been doing this. He gets the bug, and he, it gets, it's kind of a way for him to meet the next generation of all the new young out guys. And um, so we just showed up, and he didn't say anything to anybody, and other people show up showed up as well. And But he's a very manipulative cat, and, and he would call a rehearsal, like I mean like a six-hour rehearsal, and then – if you showed up an hour late, he might tell you to get the hell out of here. He might say there's rehearsal tomorrow, and then he wouldn't show up, but, like, his assistant would show up to see who still stayed around for the whole six hours. I mean, it was just this crazy, crazy thing, but it was exciting. I mean, I, I, I got to hear these improvised. I met Steve Swell, the great trombone player, and Susie Ibarra was there, and um, Chris Jonas, this outdoor or soprano sax player, and Chris Lightcap the great bass player. I mean, there's a bunch of guys my age who are all gone on to really great careers so far who I met in that in that ensemble. Um, I can't say that musically at the end of the day it was that fulfilling. We did a series of gigs at the old knitting factory, and in the end it just became 15 guys all playing at the same time and just this cacophony of... But I did learn a lot about Cecil's process and which was fascinating, and he's a really interesting cat and, a, and a, an amazing musician. I would rather hear Cecil play trio or solo than him in a large ensemble, I think. But how he disseminates his, his kind of unique way of organizing music was really fascinating. So I'll say that. And you've had a lot of other collaborations. You talked about Eddie Palmieri. What about Joey Sellers? It seems like you've had a long collaborative existence with him. What's that been like? Joey, I'm happy to say he's one of my best friends in life. I love Joey. And that was maybe the most formative experience I ever had in New York. Um, I, I found my way in those early years into like the Latin scene, which I always loved. And I was working all the time. Cause it, I mean, at the end of the day, there's not that much work for jazz trombonists, period. And um, especially as a new guy in town. So I needed to work. And I love playing salsa and Latin jazz and and, and I found my way. I could do that well, and, and I fell into that. So I was doing a lot of that. And But at the same time, I, I, I hadn't found my, I guess, just click, for lack of a better word, of guys or like-minded improvisers. Again, more adventurous spirits, but, but not super free jazz. And no disrespect to that. I love that as well. It's just that's not what I want, where I wanted to be. So guys who were writing their own music and could play inside and could play outside and 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 it's just also attitude, guys who weren't jerks, to be quite frank, which there was a lot of angst and acrimony in those those early 90s 
between the downtown guys and the uptown guys, but I met Joey just through some mutual friends. He had just moved to New York from, from the West Coast, and um, he was having open rehearsals because he didn't really know that many guys in New York with his 10-piece band at the Musicians' Union. And just through word of mouth, he wasn't, like, offering anybody a gig, and there was no money, but he would just have rotating rehearsals. And then after a while, I think in his head, the band just started forming itself. Like, the right guys would fall into the right chair, and then that became the band. And, I mean, that band, talk about a loaded lineup. I mean, the, the end lineup was uh, David Berkman on piano and John Bear on bass and Michael Serene on drums and the great Tony Malaby and Adam Colker and John O'Gallagher and Conrad Herwig, the amazing trombonist, and Dave Ballou. And, I mean, and then Taylor Haskins, the great creative trumpet player. It was – and these guys were all roughly the same age. And um, it was – but and I finally felt I, I remember almost in tears. I mean, not to get all sappy on, I mean, being coming home from a gig one night and feeling it's that, that it was just the relief of like I finally found guys who I could be myself around, kind of, and and they're going to encourage me and and I'm going to be inspired by them. And Joey, his compositions, I still to this day I would consider him one of my biggest influences, especially on larger ensemble writing and. And then later, Joey took the, the, the trombone section in the band was Conrad Herwig, me, and Dave Taylor, who's the greatest bass trombone player alive. And, um, and, and with Joey himself, we had a trombone quartet, and we would gig, and it was also one of the most creative experiences. I mean, he would, he would have Dave Taylor recite Bukowski poetry through a megaphone while the three of us improvised, or he would adapt... Um, Satie piano pieces for four trombones, but with with improvisation built in. I mean, it was it was oh. a really formative time, just as my creative voice was developing. Wow, that's very cool, very cool. Speaking of your creative voice, you've really had decades to groom it. You've had a l- nice long career up to this point as a soloist, a collaborative individual, working on Sesame Street. How do you feel about your career up to this point in your life? I feel very fortunate. I mean. Uh, I, in many ways, it's exceeded what I ever thought was possible. I truly feel blessed. I mean, I, I think that that's a tough question. Um, I think as a player, I'm only getting better and better, and I haven't even peaked yet, and that's exciting to me because of thinking of all the things I've done. I mean, I know when I practice and when I'm writing. It's, I don't know. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of looking forward. Now, looking back, it's been – it's been unbelievable. I mean, playing with your heroes and playing like Eddie Palmieri, for example, because you meant, I mean, to me, he's like on the level of, you know, Coltrane or Miles Davis in the Latin scene. And he's specifically my favorite band leader. And to come up listening to his records and to, especially like his early band from the sixties was called La Perfecta and it had two trombones and flute was the horn section. And then Eddie briefly resurrected La Perfecta in the early 2000s, and that's when I first started playing with Eddie. So to be playing, sometimes I, 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 it freaks me out, to be playing those tunes with Eddie, and then the gig's over, and I'm at the bar at the hotel, and I'm picking his brain about stories from 1964 with Barry Rogers or whoever. It, it freaks you out. It's just, it'll be literally like playing like kind of blue tunes with Miles. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, it's... And so you look back at those kind of experiences and I think, holy moly, I can't, I, I'm lucky enough, I think one of the things that served me well and really I, I can look back on and think this has served me the best is the fact that I just love playing trombone and I love playing music. And it even goes back to Glenn Miller, Broadway shows. It didn't matter when the phone would ring and it was, you're playing this kind of jazz. I don't care. Let's go do it. And I'll do it the best I could do. And, and not, you know, I used to, used to be a joke but I'm the only guy who's played with Wynton Marsalis and Cecil Taylor, you know, and because it didn't matter. It was all kind of apples and oranges to me. I didn't, I just wanted to play with good players and be able to improvise and try to fit my improvisatory voice into whatever situation I'm in. And, and it's, it's really worked out very nicely. So let me ask you a general question, kind of to counter this reflective question that I just asked you. Why do you love jazz? Uh, that's a great question, but I'm not, 
I'm not exactly sure, to be honest. I love the spirit of it. I love the – let me put it to you this way. I don't love all jazz. I love playing any kind of jazz, but that's the difference between listening to jazz. I love guys improvising without a net. Though That kind of thing excites me to the core. Um, when I listen to Ray Anderson on trombone or listen to some of those Mingus, Mingus bands, um, the idea that I'm going to push myself to the limits as an improviser, and there may be, quote, wrong notes or weird moments where they paint themselves into a corner, the the daring and the, and the self-revelation that exists in, 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 in the moment in those instances, that to me is so exciting. And I see guys who I consider great, I, I mean, to use Anthony Braxton's word, uh, he calls guys stylists who like or in the bebop style and, in, and they still play in that style or, or whatever style, bebop or avant-garde, whatever. But you kind of know what's coming. You know, they're, they're so mature and have such a grasp of that vocabulary that it's amazing in that style, but it's not very, for me specifically, it's not very compelling. And I don't find it very exciting because I could predict, even though within some range of accuracy, what's coming next. Even though they're great, they're sound, they're time. They're no choice. They're everything about them is very polished. I don't, that's not what drives me. And so I guess a better way to answer is it's the jazz guys who, who really work without a net. That, that's what I love about jazz. And I, I just find that because for me, it's still a tool of self discovery. And, I, and I'm, that it's become more like a cult for me or a cult or a, just a day to day zen existence by trying to approach my playing. To those standards. So let me ask you this. This is going to be a dual question. What's one of the best live jazz shows you've ever seen? And then if you could get into a time machine, the Jazz DeLorean, and go back in time and see a show in history, where would you go and who would you see? There's a couple moments that stick out. I mean, I think when I look back, my early years in New York, going to the, when the Knitting Factory first moved downtown from Houston Street, they were down on Leonard Street. And I saw so many shows down there that were stuff I've never seen. No, I guess two, I'll say. There's one that was a group, a trombone group called Slide Ride. That was a collective group with Ray Anderson, uh, George Lewis, Craig Harris, and uh, Mary Valente. And I went there, and it just messed me up. The, the level of trombone playing was so ridiculous. And the creativity and the fearlessness. Talk about what I was just referring Guys were disassembling their trombones and playing just through the slide and playing just through the bell part and just playing their mouthpiece to add texture. I mean, that, I never knew that kind of playing existed. I mean, I, I've never witnessed anything. But but not doing it as some kind of shticky moment, just strictly as a musical device. I, that that was such a profound concert for me. And also the technical display of George Lewis and Ray Anderson specifically. I'd heard them on records a million times at this and I'd seen Ray before, but never George live. And wow. And then also the raw power. I used to go almost every Monday night to see the David Murray big band because it was an all-star cast of characters in those days. I mean, it was really the the whole world saxophone quartet, who's my one of my biggest inspirations. I mean, Oliver Lake was in the group, Hammy Blewett, David, Bob Stewart on tuba, and Frank Lacey on trombone, and Butch Morris conducted yeah. the group and. There was just a raw energy, and also, the, the again, the, you didn't know it was coming, and Butch would do this, he has this conduction technique, I don't know if you know, and uh, where he just gets raw ensembles, and then he, he builds his vocabulary with his baton for different textures and different solos, but Butch would use his conduction techniques on top of existing written material, and... It was amazing, and it was the first time I'd seen a big band or any group, especially when you go more than one night, or, that was flying by the seat of their pants. Maybe the tune had an A, B, C form, and one night they never play B or C. They get into A, and it's so happening, and Butch keeps them in A and starts conducting stuff over top of it, and you're like they're blowing the roof off. And the next week you go, and they play A, B, and they get to C and just stay in C, or they jump back to A. And it's just it was wildly unpredictable and the soloists of all sorts were so compelling. And so, I mean, maybe it wasn't one night in particular, but those guys, that messed me up too. It was just blew my head open. Yeah. Um, as far as time machine, 
You know, I, I'm one of the weird guys that I'm not some nostalgic guy for, like, Miles or Coltrane from back in the day. And there's no – I mean that with the greatest respect to those guys. And, my, I mean, my – my formative time was in the 80s, you know, and um, where I – and I identify weirdly where most people in books anyway and, and critically, people talk about the 80s as some low time in jazz. I, I find it as the most exciting time. So I would go back to those times when I was growing up in Pittsburgh and bands weren't coming through, the kind of bands I wanted to see. Um, Benny Wallace, the great saxophone player, had a – quintet with Ray Anderson, I would go back to see that band live and go back to see early World Saxophone Quartet concerts that I have on record. But again, it's not the same as, and I have all the records of Benny Wallace as well from that era. But I mean, Ray Anderson's by far my biggest influence in this, to be able to see him at an earlier point in his life. And he went through Bell's palsy and, um, and I just threw the grapevine, uh, just knowing what he played like on record before the Bells apology. His recovery from it is remarkable, but to see him live with his bass drum, bass drum bone group, for example, in the late 70s, to go back and see that before his Bells apology, I would have been, I don't know what would have happened. I would have exploded. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let me ask you this kind of on a nostalgic route here. What's the last vinyl LP you dropped the needle down on? I'm without a turntable right now. I moved three years ago, no one a turntable. But I can tell you the last ones I bought. <laughs> I bought a World Saxophone Quartet record, actually. I bought this is last week. And from from the Moors Festival in Germany, a live one, which I can't wait to hear. And then I got a Benny Golson International Jazz Orchestra with this crazy lineup of Benny Bailey and Cecil Payne and Gracia Moncour on trombone and but, I mean, I have, I'm sitting outside my office right now and looking at my vinyls piled up here. The last one, if I could think off the top of my head, though, when I still have my turntable, it might have been there was an international trombone workshop record I have with Albert Mangelsdorf and the great Swedish trombone player, Aya Taleen and Slide Hampton. They did a workshop in Germany, and, and the, you know, the Europeans record everything, and there's a recording of them, those three guys with a big band that's, stunning and i that may be the last one i listened to right on so what's one of the nicest things that a fan has ever said to you about your work i've had a couple young kids say to me that they really are inspired by me and that, that means a lot because i know that feeling of being a young guy and being inspired been able been, so that meant a lot i mean because I, I sometimes you think you exist in a vacuum and i and i'm you know being a trombone leader who doesn't play mainstream music, you know, like a Michael Dees, or which is way more mainstream than what I'm doing, it's sometimes you think you exist in some weird vacuum. So it's nice to get some feedback, just for, especially from younger guys who are finding their own way, because I know how hard that was for me. Um, I had a moment with, with Eddie Palmieri that really resonates. When I first started playing with Eddie, um, the great when he had his band, as I mentioned, La Perfecta back in the '60s. The two trombone players were Barry Rogers and Jose Rodriguez, and um, and, and that was the sound, like the, the Latin trombone sound for all ages. Is that and and um, probably the greatest Latin trombone player alive right now is a guy named Jimmy Bosch. And when I used to play with Eddie with La Perfecta, it would be me and Jimmy Bosch. And one night we were playing in out in the West Coast in Oakland at Yoshi's. And um, Eddie's wife of many years, who recently passed away, was there. And um, she came up to us, Jimmy and I, after the gig and said, you know, I was sitting there and I was had my eyes closed and it's the closest it's ever been to Barry and Jose. And it was, I was just blown away. It was so, that was fantastic. Right on. Especially, you know, as a, as a yeah. Anyway. No, that's that's beautiful. What's the greatest thing about the trombone for you? I, I think the trombone is the most expressive instrument. I mean, a lot, a lot of guys throughout history have said it's the closest to a human voice. I think the slide, which most people look at it as a limiting characteristic, because you can't play as fast as a saxophone or a trumpet or piano, I find that is the greatest thing. It's you're it's just flipping it on. And Ray Anderson, I mean, I never talked to Ray about this, but he, I saw him in interviews in the 80s saying the same thing. 
getting into the idiosyncrasies of the instrument and using them to your advantage. I love it. And it's become, I can't, I mean, the fact that I'm on trombone at this point, I can't ever imagine not being on it. But I love the fact that there's a slide. And I could play, I mean, I can't play. Like, Mike, like I keep coming back to Mike Deese because he's in my head now. Mike Deese is, like, unbelievable technician. And I can't play as fast as him. But, I mean, I can get close in certain <laughs> respects to his playing, but he's so phenomenal. And that clean, you know, coming out of a slide hand to J.J. Bebop language and technique is a better way to put it. But, but again, I think when you only play that way, and I'm not to say this is not about Mike anymore, that when you win trombonists, only play that way and stay in that clean language that J.J. all – because J.J. essentially has influenced, you know, 90-plus percent of jazz trombone players in some way. I find you're losing the greatest advantage. And, and that's not to say you should play like some Dixieland player and be tailgating all over the place, but there's such magic in using the slide to your advantage. Again, to, 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 it, it comes back to the human voice. The human voice doesn't operate like a trumpet machine or a saxophone machine. And to be able to slip and slide and, and go against the grain with the slide, and whereas you're using the slide to go up, in the scale by pushing it away from you versus coming the opposite. It's, I find it's, been, it's the greatest expressive thing, and especially with the use of mutes. I love, and other trumpet players do, but combining the slide with the different mute combinations, is, for me, has just become the greatest uh, creative expression tool I can imagine. So everything's going to come down to this final question. I want to know this. Everyone has a version <laughs> of who you are. <laughs> Your family, your friends, those that you play live for, the, the people that you work with. But I want to know, when you leave your house and go out into the world and you take everything that you are and put it out there, who are you? Who do you think you are? Wow. I, I mean, at the core, I mean, I think I'm a jazz musician and an improviser at the core. And I think my passion, I, I just think I'm a passionate creator. As a, if I'm going to have to simplify it into some simple form, I think how I think about writing music for my own groups and how I think about creative practice and, and developing my own sound is the same. That place that all that's generated from is the same place I write Sesame Street music from, sincerely. I mean, I'll write these under school because a lot of it could be, you know, cartoony and we'll be in the recording session and for Sesame Street, and some will say, how did you ever come up with that? And why, how did you think of this? And not that it's great or bad, just it's just different and a little bit. And I, I just think I view myself as just this creative spirit, and I try to bring that to, the, to other aspects of my non-musical life, too. But uh, I, I guess at, at the core, it's being an honest, hardworking, creative spirit is how I kind of feel about myself and it's just the trombone happens to be my main vehicle for expressing those things beautiful i think that's a great way to wrap and sum everything up joe thank you for taking some time out opening up and giving me your world i appreciate it joe i appreciate the time too thank you very much thanks for listening and tuning in to yet another neon jazz interview where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in new york kansas city and spots all over the world giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Joe for his time, his music, and those great stories. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store. Visit NeonJazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz, go to the NeonJazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the music, my friends. Neon Jazz.